So let's take a look at the results from our water cycle game from yesterday and summarize what this was meant to show you. First of all, you were given a new, smaller map of the locations where we find water in the water cycle. And this is going to be the final copy that you're going to put into your notebook and use as a reference. In order to summarize the information presented, make it neater and cleaner, you're going to need two different colored pencils or markers or pens. The colors don't matter so much, but the pattern in which you mark the pages does. So as I go through the presentation and I use different colors for different pathways, you need to make sure you continue to follow the same pattern. I'm going to use an orange and a purple just because that's the colors that are available to me uh, on this presentation and they, they, are, they contrast with one another so you can follow along. But it doesn't really matter so long as at the end you have a key that tells you what the different colors represent. First of all, let's start off with clouds because clouds is kind of where we left off with water last semester. You understand the process. Water evaporates from the sky, for, from the ocean, and goes up here and gets cold, makes a cloud. But then the opposite also happens that water will fall from a cloud and go right back into the ocean. So we see water kind of goes back and forth between clouds and the oceans. I'm going to mark this on my key over here with an arrow going this way and then an arrow going this way, which shows me that water can go from clouds to oceans and then can turn right back around and go from oceans back to clouds. I'm using orange to denote locations or pairs of locations where water can go back and forth. Now, when you did this yesterday, you should have seen water went back and forth a lot between oceans and clouds. And we're not going to draw a bunch of arrows, but we're going to put little tick marks on here to kind of represent that hey, I went this path a bunch of different times. And I'm going to really overemphasize how much I go back and forth between oceans and clouds because that's what really happens in the water cycle. Water goes from the oceans to clouds and right, right back down into the ocean again. That is by far the most frequent exchange of water on our planet. And it makes sense because, look, 75% of our planet is covered in water. So that's where the water for evaporation comes from to make clouds in the first place. And when it rains, there's a much better chance that that water from a cloud is going to fall on the oceans than it is going to fall on land. So you get it. In the water cycle, water moves back and forth between clouds and the oceans far much more times than it does any other two spots. So let's talk about where else can water go from a cloud. Well, water can fall as snow, and if it lands in some place where it's pretty cold, the snow can pile up and it can form a glacier. A glacier is a big, huge ice sheet. It's a big frozen collection of water on the land. So I need to draw an arrow from clouds going to glaciers. Snow falls from a cloud and goes to a glacier. Now notice I did this with an orange arrow. And I already said, for me, my orange arrows are going to represent a, a time where water can go back and forth. So water can also come from a glacier and go back into a cloud. Now, once water is in, in a glacier, where can it go? I just said, here's my glacier. And glaciers can evaporate. They're just water. And the water goes up into the air and it forms a cloud. Well, then the, the cloud can, can drop snow right back on top of the glacier. So that's a demonstration for you about how water can go back and forth between clouds and glaciers. So once water gets into a glacier, it can go right back up into a cloud. So we already have this relationship here. But let's look at where else water can go from a glacier. Glaciers will melt. Once they move to a low enough elevation, the glacier, the ice will melt and then it turns into a liquid and it's going to flow downhill. Well, there I've got a river. So water can go from a glacier and then flow into a river. I'm going to draw an arrow from glaciers to rivers. Now, if you'll notice, I drew this in purple. Purple on this key is going to represent when water can only go one direction between those locations. And this is true. Rivers cannot freeze and turn into a glacier. 
Glaciers are only formed when snow falls and piles up. Well, snowfall doesn't come from a river. Snowfall only comes from clouds. So when you talk about water moving between glaciers and rivers, it only goes one way. A glacier water can become a river water, not vice versa. Glaciers can sometimes end up at the ocean, which means the glacier water can then become part of the ocean water. Well, I'm going to draw another arrow. Notice I drew that in purple. That's another one-way street. Remember, the only way snow gets into a glacier is from snow falling from a cloud. An ocean cannot add water to a glacier, but a glacier water can become part of the ocean. Now, sometimes glaciers don't do either one. They don't melt and form a river, and they don't meet the ocean. They just kind of stop. They get to a low enough elevation, and they just kind of slowly melt. Well, what happens to that water is glacial water can soak into the soil. Well, we call that water down there underground groundwater. So water from glaciers can move to groundwater. And notice that is a purple arrow for me. It means water only goes one way because groundwater can't become snow. Snow only comes from clouds. So basically for water to get into a glacier, it must fall from a cloud. It can get out a couple of different ways, but it can only get to a glacier from clouds as snowfall. So where else can water can go from clouds besides oceans and glaciers? Well, water can fall from a cloud as rain. And sometimes you can get a rain that falls into a lake or a pond. It can land, that water can land on a lake just like it can land on an ocean. Well, water from lakes and ponds can also evaporate and form clouds. So that's going to be a two-way arrow. Same is true with rivers. It can rain into a river, and then rivers can also evaporate and form back into clouds. When it rains and the water hits the ground, the ground, the dirt on the top of the ground is called our soil. So you get how the ground gets wet after rainfall. Water can move from a cloud into soil. Well, if you wait a couple days, you know the soil is going to dry up. The water in the soil is going to evaporate again and go right back up into the air and help to form clouds. So let's look at rivers. Where can water go from a river? First and foremost, most rivers wind up at the ocean. So starting at ocean, I'm going to draw a line and an arrow to rivers. Notice I did this in purple because it doesn't go backwards. Water from an ocean never comes into or up river. It's always a one-way street. Water can go from rivers into oceans. And I just drew that backwards, sorry. From rivers to oceans, not the other way around. Well, what else can rivers do is sometimes rivers are flowing along like our Chattahoochee River is flowing along North Georgia and it flows into Lake Lanier and then it flows out the other side of the lake on its way to the ocean. So with rivers and lakes, you can have a two-way street. Water can go from a river into a lake and water can also come from a lake back into a river. Okay. Now let's take a look about where else the water from a river can go. Well, here I got a cow, a cow sitting there drinking the water. The water that is in that river now becomes part of the cow. That's a place where water winds up in the water cycle. Any place where we can find water has got to be a part of this map. So I'm going to draw an arrow from a river to animals. Now notice I drew that in orange. Well, that means water from an animal can go right back into the river, and that is true. That cow sitting there drinking the water, he is just as likely to pee, standing right there where he is, and the water that is part of the cow that he passes out then goes right back into the river. Now, same is true with rivers and clouds. 
emphasize this. This is going to be a two-way street that we should already have on our key. It can rain into a river and it can evaporate from a river. Now, groundwater. Groundwater is a little bit harder to understand because we're not down there. We don't see it. But sometimes water can come straight up out of the ground, like right here. That's a cave, a hole in the ground, and water is coming up out of the ground, and it piles up, and then it starts to flow this way. We've got a river that has its source coming from up under the ground. So water from the ground can make a river. But it's also true that over here, some of that river water is also seeping right back down into the ground. So this is gonna be one of those two-way streets where water can move both directions. So lakes and ponds, we get this, we should already have this, that water can evaporate from a lake and make a cloud and rainfall from a cloud can fall right into a lake. The same is true here. Lakes and ponds can go into rivers and rivers can go into lakes and ponds. Already had that. Okay. Lakes and ponds can also go into groundwater. That water from a lake can seep into the ground. And just like with a river, sometimes groundwater pops up out of the ground and makes a little lake. So this is gonna be another two-way exchange. Now, let's get a little bit more uh, in-depth here with the animals. How do animals fit into the water cycle? Well, one, we got this, that, that animals can drink from a lake or a pond. Well, animals can also put water right back into a lake or a pond. They can sit there and pee while those zebras are very likely to pee while they're standing right there, and the water they pass out of their bodies goes right back into the lake or pond. Now, we're the same way that we're an animal and we get water from rivers. Okay. We're an animal. We can also put water right back into a river from us. And we'll take a look at that here in just a second. Let's talk about plants first. There's water in plants. You know, there's water in trees and animals like this cow here eats the plant. So the water that was in the plant is now in the animal. So we're gonna draw an arrow from plants and trees to animals. Notice that is a one-way arrow. An animal cannot put water back into a plant. Even if the animal pees on the grass, that water goes into the ground, it doesn't go into the plant directly. Plants only take up water through their roots. So how does water get out of animals and where does it go after it leaves an animal? Think about us. We sweat. We pass out water through our pores and that water evaporates and it helps to keep us cool. So any water that goes into the air can become part of a cloud. Notice this is a one-way direction. That it doesn't matter how much you stand outside in the heaviest of thunderstorms. Water is not going to enter your body directly from a cloud. Water from your body can sweat and evaporate and go to being part of a cloud, but it, that's a one-way exchange of water. Now, animals like our cows here, they pee outside and more than likely they're not going to be peeing in the river or in the lake or the pond. They're probably going to be peeing on the ground. Well, what happens to that water? The water goes into the soil. So, we're gonna draw an arrow from animals to soil. Notice it's a one-way arrow because animals don't take water out of the soil. They don't put soil in their mouth and take the water out of it. So this is a one-way exchange. Water from an animal goes into the soil. Now remember, we are animals. Animals can also put water into rivers or they can also put them into lakes or ponds they have to be standing there and pee into the river or lake or pond and once again we are animals so in theory we do the same thing the water that comes out of us that is not sweat that is urine either goes into the ground or goes into rivers and lakes and ponds because we're animals and we follow this pattern now remember we get our drinking water generally from those same 
lakes and rivers and streams. So this seems like a problem. We we're putting pee in the water and then we're turning around and drinking it. Well, this is why we can't drink water directly from rivers. We get our water into our body from the river. When you turn on the tap here locally, that tap is connected to the Chattahoochee River. But the water was clean. It runs through a treatment plant. And you can something like this. It's filtered and then purified and has chlorine added to it. And then it comes out of your tap. But the water came from the Chattahoochee. Well, what happens to the water when we pee it out? Where does the water go? Well, like all other animals, it's either going to go into the ground or it's going to go into a river or a lake. Now, we don't generally go outside and pee directly onto the ground, but your toilet might be connected to what's called a septic tank. This is a lot more true in rural areas, not so much here in Metro Atlanta, where the water from your toilet goes down to a tank underground. And the water, just the H2O, leaks out of that septic tank and goes into the ground. So that's how water from your body, from your urine, ends up being part of the soil or groundwater. What gets left behind in the septic tank is any of the dirty part of our, of our waste. The same is true with the river. We put our pee right back in the river. Now, we don't do it directly, but when you flush the toilet, the water and your urine, which is mostly water, goes to a water treatment plant where all of the nasty stuff is taken out of the urine and the leftover water gets dumped right back in the river. So we follow the same pattern as the cows and the other animals do. That water that comes out of our body either goes back into the ground or it goes back into a river or a lake. It kind of depends upon where your sewage from your toilet is directed. Here in Roswell, we have something like this. this is a water treatment plant. You can see the river right here. Water came out of that river to drink. It also came out of that river to flush our toilet. Well, before we put the water back in the river, we run it through a water treatment plant, which is what you see here. This takes all the nastiness out of our sewage, out of our toilet water, and then puts just the H2O back into the river. Now let's take a look at soil. When it rains, water sits there on the soil. So water from a cloud can come down and soak into the soil. Notice this is a red or an orange arrow because water also can go from soil back up into clouds. If you come out here in a couple of days, you know the soil is not going to be wet anymore because a lot of that water in the soil is going to have evaporated and gone right back up into the cloud. So this is a two-way movement of water. Plants and trees. Plants and trees get their water from soil. They take up water from their roots, which is in the soil. So water moves like that. Notice it's a one way. Plants and trees don't put water into the soil. They only take it out. So how does water get out of a, out of a plant or a tree? That's our friend transpiration again. You know that plants take up water from the soil and they move it up and then they spit it out of their leaves into the air. So on our map, we're going to have that for plants and trees where water comes out of plants and trees, gets spit up into the air and it can go be part of a cloud. It doesn't work the other way around. When it rains on a plant, plants do not take up water directly from rain. They only get it from soil. Finally, groundwater. Now groundwater is a little bit trickier to show you pictures of because it's deep underground. But we already marked that groundwater can come from glaciers. We can go back and forth between rivers, lakes, and ponds. You can also go from soil to groundwater. In addition, something I didn't mention before, sometimes soil can go to being the start of a river. So now we have pretty much all of our P 
pieces of the puzzle here. This is primarily how water moves in the planet. I have one error I need to add to this for you to this glaciers to the ocean. Check your work. Make sure you have all of these arrows and the color coding correct, whether it's a one way or a two way motion. Also, make sure that you put checks on the locations where you had checks written on your paper. You should have seen a lot of checks here, 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 and here. Those are places where water stays a long time. Notice the other places water doesn't stay. Think about animals. You're an animal. How long does water stay in you? You drink a water bottle, it's not going to be in you, but for a couple hours where you have to get rid of it. Water in a river doesn't stay in one place. It keeps moving. Clouds. Clouds don't last very long because you know when they dump their water, the clouds go away. Plants and trees. You know you got to water your house plants every couple of days because they run out of water. They will dry out and die. Same thing with soil. You've got to put the water in the soil of the house plant because the soil will not stay damp enough to support your plants. So you've got places where water stays and it doesn't stay. So once you've completed this, bring this to us to get a done stamp for having this key done. In addition, you are going to pick up a set of conclusion questions that you are going to answer based on the pattern that you see here in what was just explained to you in the presentation. And for that, you will be given a key first thing tomorrow.